Hey everyone, welcome to Punkcast. My name is William Maxwell. I'm a student of Web3 and the owner of Punk9527. CryptoPunks are 10,000 uniquely generated characters stored permanently on the Ethereum blockchain. No punk is the same. This is a show dedicated to celebrating the punks behind the punk. My hope for this podcast is that we capture the essence of the punk culture, elevate the brand and the individual behind the punk. One last thing. Projects discussed on the show is not financial advice. Crypto and NFTs are a volatile and risky asset class. Please always do your own research. Other than that, let's go. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of PunkCast. Today, we're back with Punk7934. It's a clean ball of punk with three addies, classic shades, earring, and the iconic blue and white headband. In real life, he's a huge collector of things, art, watches, sneakers, and now NFTs. Is also an entrepreneur and currently building Monarch, a curated community of collectors. Please welcome Champagne Wong to the show. Champagne Wong, how are you, man? Maxwell, my guy, what's going on, man? I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Now, of course, man. I wanted to have this chat as soon as you as soon as you got your punk and once you were in. I know I know we've had a few conversations prior to you getting your punk, but uh, would love to sort of uh, unpack your personal story. Yeah, I'm really excited about this. This is kind of like. Uh... You, you definitely were part of the inspiration for me to even get a crypto pump. So really, uh, really excited to be here for sure. I appreciate it, man. Well, wh- why don't you kick us off then? And, you know, what's the story behind Champagne Wong? Because it sounds very Drake-like. <laughs> very, very Drake-like. Huh? Um, yeah, so I guess I, I could definitely say that I had been living this kind of collectibles lifestyle my entire life for 30 plus years now. And um I would say that one facet of the collectibles world is to be able to reflect and celebrate great opportunities, relationships, and of course the collectibles themselves. And what better way to celebrate than popping a bottle of champagne? But I don't really know how accurate that is to my lifestyle. I'd say that my (laughs) wife would probably disagree that. And the last time we probably popped a bottle was uh, five years ago, I would say. (laughs) Well, um, hopefully this year we can pop more bottles of champagne, mate. The, um, the markets are back, are back to green, which is a, which is a good sign. We love green. But yeah, man, like, why don't you uh, kick us off with giving us a, an intro to yourself? You know, who are where you grew up? You know, what you sort of studied, collected all the way up leading to pre pre NFTs. It'd be good to sort of go from there. That was great, man. So yeah, I I basically grew up in um, a small town called in, in Durham, North Carolina. So um, obviously Chinese heritage. Both my parents were. Uh, professors. They, they're actually currently professors at Duke to this day. And uh, growing up, I, I um, was kind of a rebel towards my parents. I was a huge sneaker enthusiast. And um, growing up, I was actually basically just me and my best friend were the only two uh, in my kind of friend circles to really be into sneakers the way that I was. And, you know, I grew up five minutes from Duke University, 10 minutes from the University of North Carolina, two of the top uh, basketball schools in the country. Um, I think they've always been like uh, number one, number two uh, throughout the years of me growing up. And so uh, I would say North Carolina is kind of like the mecca of basketball. I think some people may argue New York, but I would uh, I would uh, say North Carolina for sure. And so that's the home of MJ, right? Like, do you, does he have much to do with North, North Carolina at all? Or uh... Of course, man, of course. And I would say that Michael Jordan actually also had a lot of uh, um, I would say my collecting has a uh, has definitely been impacted a lot by Michael Jordan as well. So, um, you know, I've been a huge sneaker collector as a kid, and I was fortunate enough to uh, get to be very close towards the basketball Duke basketball team and University of North Carolina basketball team. Um, one of my family friends was the team doctor for Duke basketball. So, um, you know, even when I was in elementary school, middle school, high school, uh, I was always able to be around those players at Duke and Carolina. And the great thing was, was um, from a sneaker perspective, um, because they were the two top basketball schools in the, in the country, uh, UNC was obviously sponsored by Michael Jordan. Um, Duke was uh, sponsored by Nike. And so they were always given very exclusive sneakers only made specifically for the basketball teams. And so um, I always stayed very close to the players and, um, uh, I would always wait for them to basically turn into seniors. And once they finish their uh, basketball career, I would actually be buying these uh, very exclusive sneakers off of the players. And so I ended up being 
uh, basically the only kid uh, outside of these basketball teams with these very exclusive shoes. They were basically prototype sneakers only made for the uh, basketball players. And I think that that kind of really kickstarted my uh, collecting career. And I would also say that um, it gave me a unique edge in the sneaker world, especially because uh, I had some uh, very rare shoes that no one else had. Nice. <clears throat> so <clears throat> these are these shoes, like... I mean, how would you sort of pick them up? Would you just go and chat to the players and sort of say, hey, man, like, so, so give let me a pair tell of you, I, and... I, Yeah, I basically, uh, uh, as I mentioned, I grew up on Duke campus mostly, um, you know, because my parents worked at Duke. I was always on college campus. Um, I was always hanging around the basketball team. Uh, I would sit through some of the Duke basketball practices. And, of course, I was formulating a lot of relationships with a lot of players who also shared a similar passion in collecting sneakers, but, um, you know, they always, uh, uh, wanted to kind of sell these shoes and I would basically have, you know, get their contact information and wait for them to, uh, graduate. And then I would buy these sneakers off them. And, um, yeah, I, I became, I became pretty well known on college campus to basically fund a lot of these guys as uh, college <laughs> careers. And so, um, yeah, it became a very unique opportunity for me to, to uh, make a lot of uh, very unique relationships as well. And many of the players that went to Duke and UC ended up going to the NBA as well. So that's kind of what uh, obviously triggered more of my uh, uh, later part of my career as well. Nice. Just out of curiosity, like what are these shoes worth today, do you think? Oh, man, I can tell you. Uh, there is one particular sneaker that comes from University of North Carolina that I would say is the holy grail uh, for many sneaker collectors, especially the prototype collectors, and it's called the UNC Jordan 4. Uh, that one was released, I think, around 2012 or 2013, and it was given to uh, the UNC basketball team. So I think there was only 16 pairs made in the world. And the Jordan 4 is probably one of the most uh, popular Jordan sneaker models out there. And when they did this UNC colorway, um, you know, it was, it was just kind of a smash hit and, you know, they put this like Tar Heel logo foot logo on the tongue and it had kind of this like acrylic, like, um, uh, UNC banner on the, on the bottom of the sneaker. And it just became, uh, very well known as like a Holy grail in the sneaker world. And I would say that, uh, during the time I was buying those shoes, uh, they were costing me anywhere from two to $3,000. And I would say, uh, now if you were to find a pair of those, uh, they would probably fetch around fifty thousand dollars right now. Wow, that's insane. And and does the the provenance of the shoe matter at all? Like uh, from which players, or uh, it doesn't really matter because they were college kids. Uh, I think it it didn't really matter, but um, uh, no, I'd say that the uh, sneakers were just so sought after that if you could get your hands on any of those pairs, I mean, out of sixteen pairs, it's been it, it's damn near impossible to get your hands on any of them. So I would say. Obviously, it adds a little bit more value to to them if you got like the superstar players pair. But um, outside of that, I, I don't really think it mattered. And even size doesn't really matter as well because a lot of those athletes are wearing you know anywhere from size you know twelve to sixteen. So these things are massive, and you can imagine the storage <laughs> on those things just takes up so much space. But I was also able to get the size ten for one of the uh, managers of the team. I think it was the only size ten out there. So. I, I have a lot of uh, top steer collectors chasing that pair off me to this day. Awesome. But mate, just to go back a little bit too, you said that your parents um, are teachers at Duke. Like what are they, what are they sort of, what sort of are they teaching? Yeah. So uh, my mom does plant biology and my dad is a cancer research um, scientist. And so you can imagine I had a lot of kind of pushback from, you know, traditional Chinese parents, um, I would say that, you know, collecting is all about this kind of battle within mental health. And I would say that uh, neither of my parents, when I was growing up, really understood understood me. You know, they were kind of confused as to why I was like so deeply uh, involved and interested in these sneakers. And I was also a big sports card collector as well. And um, growing up, I was uh, 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 one of very few kids buying sports cards in my in my town and you know, my parents just couldn't understand it. So I would actually buy boxes of cards, basically wait for my parents to go to sleep. And I would lock the door and be opening these packs um, <laughs> under my bed because I didn't want to make too much noise for them to hear. So yeah, I would say that collecting has been 
um, a huge mental battle for myself as well as probably many collectors who are really early into it. And, um, you know, whenever we would go to like family parties or, or gatherings of like my parents and their colleagues, they would always be like so embarrassed to talk about me. And I'm like sitting right there thinking, yo, you, you know, <laughs> you really have this much trouble, like telling your friends what I, what I'm into and what my interests are. And, you know, that actually took a huge mental toll on me as well. And so I think like, as I start to tell you more about my story, it's actually come more full circle. And I would say that uh, nowadays my parents, you know, have given me kind of their full support. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I would say that my, my childhood was a little bit rough in terms of kind of exploring my, my interest in collectibles. So is that, is that why you sort of say it was a little bit rebellious because your parents basically didn't approve of um, that sort of path? Yeah. I think that's Asian parents, right? Like, I think like if you, if you weren't like a doctor or a lawyer, you were basically, um, you're basically dead to them in some ways, right? Like, I, don't, I, don't I was dead well. for many years. <laughs> I was definitely dead for many years, man. Um, but yeah, I think like, uh, you know, the, the collectibles is, has been kind of true to my heart and also has really, I, I kind of really chased my own path. You know, I think I, both my parents are quite successful scientists. You know, they've obviously created their own worlds. And, you know, even at those parties, like I would hear their friends say, oh, why, why aren't you? you know, following your parents' footsteps and being a scientist. And I just never took interest in that. And I always just wanted to kind of chase what, you know, my interests were. And I never really let my parents steer me the wrong way. You know, I would always find a way in in terms of my collecting habits. And so, um, yeah, I, I you know, over the years, like throughout middle school, high school, and then into college, um, I went to University of North Carolina, um, uh, obviously, right, you know, right next to home. I didn't want to go to Duke University because it was like, a little bit too close to home with my parents working there. Um, but yeah, it was just connecting with more and more thinker enthusiasts. And I would say that during that time, a lot of uh, basketball players and, and musicians, uh, um, uh, specifically in hip hop, uh, were also sharing that similar passion as me. And so, you know, I started connecting with many of them and we started becoming friends throughout the years. And uh, I started building a pretty, pretty unique network going, uh, uh, basically finishing my college uh, career. I want to get into that because I know you've got an interesting story with some of those connections. Um, I'd love to sort of hear, but um, what, so what did you actually study at, uh, uh, at college? Like, Yeah. So I, I studied economics. Um, I actually study economics mostly because my, my grandfather was a pretty well-known economist in, in China. But I think during that time, man, like I, I was still like a very confused kid. Like I, I felt like I wanted to believe that I was, you know, uh, uh, destined to be a businessman. But I tell you, like, I think my journey of entrepreneurship was, was definitely, uh, um, kind of a, a long journey, I would say in terms of just finding myself and really learning to, uh, kind of love this, like, um, this path of being an entrepreneur, because I, I don't truly believe that, you know, when I studied economics, that that was something that I was truly passionate about, but I grew to love it in, in my own ways. And I think it was because of my passion for collectibles. And it's something that, you know, I just kind of catered towards what my interests were. Gotcha. No, that's cool. And um, so you were collecting, like, you know, as a kid, were you more into basketball cards? And Because I used to collect basketball cards too. And, uh, and I love that feeling about, you know, opening boxes and packs that you were sort of describing. But um, what, what was your sort of journey? So from did you go from basketball cards into – and then into sneakers at a later stage, like what was your, I guess, what was a trigger point for you to sort of say, Hey, you know what, this is something I'm super passionate about. And I want to double down on, on this going forward as a, you know, as in some ways a professional career. Yeah. I think like for me, uh, sneakers and sports cards were kind of like hand in hand, you know, I mean, like obviously sneakers were basically relatable to all of the, I mean, I was chasing sneakers that were basically made for all of the top athletes around the world from, you know, Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, uh, LeBron James. And, and yeah, I think they were very much directly correlated. And, um, you know, I, I was just so passionate about this kind of like, you know, sports culture, hip hop culture. And, um, yeah, it was just kind of th two things I like kind of took with me throughout the years. But I think as I started to get older and I was like collecting cards in college, I was thinking, man, I'm, I'm really weird because I think during that time, like, you know, social media wasn't as big as it is today. And it was really difficult to find like-minded people like myself in terms of collecting. So it was a really lonely road for myself, really trying to figure out like, are there other people out there like me? Cause like 
you know, my best friend and I, when we were growing up, we were obviously chasing these two things, but I think he kind of grew out of it a little bit. And I was thinking to myself, gosh, you know, junior, senior year in college, I'm still opening cards and none of my friends are doing this. Like, is this like <laughs> normal, you know? So like that was kind of a, a, a strange time for me, I'd say. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, well, I, I think I sort of grew out of it too, but I know what you sort of mean. Um, it, it is a, it can be a little bit of a lonely path, but like for you, like, were you sort of going to, I guess, swap meets and or trading on eBay? Like, were you flipping, flipping oh, a lot? Like, yeah, flipping a lot. I, I probably didn't make a lot of money back then. I would say, uh, especially on like the sports cards, because it was just, it was, I, I mean, I was just constantly buying things. I wasn't really selling anything. But from the sneaker, um, the sneaker perspective, I was, I was making a lot of money, uh, especially because I, I just had like a very deep understanding of what were the hot sneakers out there. And I was, I just knew how to kind of pinpoint all the rare shoes. I would say that a lot of the athletes I connected with, they weren't really enthusiastic about sports cards, but they were really into sneakers like myself. And so as many of them went to NBA, I started, you know, building a more unique network of NBA stars. Like just to give you an example, Ty Lawson was like a dear friend of mine uh, growing up in college. We were, we were uh, college classmates and he ended up going to the Denver Nuggets and, he started introing me to all the Nugget players uh, when I was in um, uh, college and, and uh, obviously when I finished college. So I just started accumulating so many connections within the sneaker world. And I kind of like put sports cards aside just because I, I, I really didn't you know find anyone that was that was doing it with me. And so I just kind of went uh, more into the sneaker world uh, uh, post-college and, and never turned back since. Oh, amazing. So you got deep into the um, the sneaker space, and then I think you mentioned a bit into the music, hip hop sort of scene as well. What was that sort of transition like? Um, yeah, where did that take so, you? So I'd say you know, obviously, as I was accumulating all of these kind of exclusive pairs from Duke and UNC uh, during that time, um, as I was kind of leaving college, uh, a lot of the social media platforms started to boom. So like, obviously, Instagram and Twitter. But I, I focused my attention on Instagram and I started to find, you know, other people that were just as enthusiastic about sneakers as I was. It was like the perfect platform for any sneakerhead. And so um, I started posting like all of these kind of rare shoes and I started to really find other like minded people like myself. And I also started getting in touch with a lot of the sneaker blogs that were just getting started at that time, like Hype Beast, uh, Complex, Sneaker News. And so I had kind of reached out to a few of those, um, uh, the writers at these sneaker blogs that were already posting my uh, sneaker posts. And we had like kind of like a handshake agreement where, you know, they would post my sneaker photos and in return. I would tell them, you know, what is coming to, you know, these universities in Duke and, and Carolina shoe wise. And so through a lot of their social media posts, a lot of uh, A-list celebrities uh, to this day, like guys like DJ Khaled, Fat Joe, uh, Derek Rose started to discover me, uh, people who were also really passionate about uh, shoes just like I was and was scouring all of these social media platforms. So, um, yeah, I think Instagram was like a huge, huge kind of um, crutch for me in terms of uh, uh, really taking my sneaker collecting to the next level and really finding other you know celebrities in, in, during that time that also shared that same passion. That's crazy. Well, so what year was this? Like, you know, you, you spoke about, you know, yeah, so this and... was probably, this was probably around 2012, 2013. So um, basically after I had graduated college, I ended up moving up to New York. Um, I ended up getting a job at a hedge fund called Liebermax Capital. And the way I got the job was that my, my uncle was um, considered a top mathematician um, in China. And so he had a friend named Eugene Xu who was working at Liebermax Capital. And I think um, I don't know if you, if you knew this, but Liebermax Capital was actually featured in the Big Short movie. And there was a scene in the movie where um, Eugene Shu, who ended up becoming my boss, was uh, kind of saying, um, you know, he had gotten second place in a math competition back in China. And he was actually second to my uncle. And so I was working at <laughs> uh, Liebermax Capital for, for two years. I wasn't passionate about it. You know, I was tr uh, doing residential mortgage-backed securities. But during my time there, I was just connecting with so many guys I had idolized growing up because I had been, you know, such a huge basketball fan. I was actually a huge Kobe Bryant fan, a huge Laker fan. 
And I just started connecting with more and more people that I idolized growing up. And it just got to a point where, you know, I, I thought, well, this isn't really for me. And I really want to kind of chase my dreams. I just didn't really feel like myself, you know, working at the hedge fund. I think the turning point was actually when I met uh, this NBA player by the name of Meta World Peace or formerly known as Ron Artest. Have you heard of him before? Yeah, he's the uh, angry dude. Um, Yeah. He was originally from the Pacers, right? Um, Pacers and then, was he Pacers? And then he went to LA? Yeah, so I'm sure you probably... I'm sure you're probably mm. familiar with the uh, malice in the palace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's huge. That was nasty. That was really nasty. Ben Wallace and all yeah. those guys got into it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so kind of like I think what really triggered me to uh, leave kind of the the finance finance world was um, that I had connected with Ron Artest, uh, who I guess had just changed his name to Meta World Peace as he got traded to the New York Knicks. But he had basically just won an NBA championship with the Lakers and. And, and for me, I was just a fan, you know, and, and, um, you know, he had, you know, touched down in New York and he had connected with me, had heard, you know, that I was like a top secret collector. And he was actually looking for some, uh, rare Kobe's for his son, Ron Artest Jr. And so we had uh, connected and I was thinking, you know, he had invited me to his home and I was thinking, man, this is <laughs> wow. like one of the scariest <clears throat> NBA players in, in history. You know, the guy who's like <laughs> punching fans in the stands, like. I was like really nervous to like meet this guy. I was thinking, man, I, I don't even know if I should go over there. And I was thinking, well, <laughs> you know, this could be a opportunity that you, you, you never get again. And I'm sure you've seen like all the fights. And I mean, he's kind of like the, the, you know, second coming of Dennis Rodman, I would say. So, you know, I went to his place and he was very, very uh, far from, from what I had originally thought he was the nicest guy on the planet. And, you know, he was, um, you know, very welcoming to me and, and, very easygoing and um and yeah we just kind of became friends and i think like for that year that first year when he was playing on the knicks like i spent a lot of time with him and throughout that time i was thinking every time i would meet with him i'm thinking man am i gonna see like the crazy like ron artest at some point like you see all <laughs> these things on tv and like the media obviously villainizes him so much and you know he has like the longest you know, suspension in, in NBA history for, for like an on-court incident. I'm thinking at some point I, I'm going to see this kind of like Ron Artest. And so I actually have a funny story about him. There was one time where um, I, I went to the New York Knicks practice uh, facility with him at, in Westchester with him and his son. And so he had just basically practiced with the Knicks. I was, um, I was just like shooting some, some hoops on the side hoop with, uh, with his son. And then we end up getting in the car with, with, um, with Meta on the way back to the city, back to his apartment. And I'm just sitting there thinking like, I'm in the passenger seat with Meta World Peace. And I'm thinking, this guy could just punch me in my face at some point. You know, he is, he is literally a mega star at that time. And, you know, one of the more famous names, I'm sitting here in the passenger seat with him. And, you know, we end up getting into the, into Manhattan and we're driving on a very busy street. I remember and all of a sudden, he just stops the car in the middle of the road. He gets out. And I'm looking at him. I'm like, what are you doing? He said, oh, uh, I forgot that there was a podcast that I have to do. I, I got to run. Can you just take the car back for me? And I'm thinking, <laughs> dude, what the fuck, man? And I look back in the back seat. I'm looking at Ron Artest Jr. You know, he's 14 years old at this time. And I'm thinking, yo, you're literally leaving me with your son in your car in the middle of Manhattan. Like, what if I like crash your fucking car, man? You know, and so like I end up getting behind the wheel and like what, what I, I drove very cautiously. Dude, you you wouldn't even believe this guy actually drives a Prius. <laughs> I, thought, Love it. I, I mean, we weren't driving the Prius. We were I think we were driving like his, his Range Rover, but he had a Prius during his time with the Knicks. So like that's really like goes against kind of what everyone would assume that he would have. And so yeah, it was it was kind of crazy, and and you know, ever since then, you know, his son and I have become close friends, and it's kind of come full <clears> circle. <throat> like he's even like now, uh, every time he comes to New York, he's like babysitting my daughter, and I'm thinking, you know, my three year old daughter. I'm thinking, yeah, I used to, I used to babysit you, man, when when you were <laughs> when your dad was playing for the New York Knicks. But I would say that you know, my experience with Meta World Peace really taught me a lot because you know, Meta World Peace is probably one of, the, as you said, like one of the scariest NBA players in NBA history. And I was intimidated, you know, but I think like I obviously 
knew that he was passionate about sneakers on behalf of his son. And I was the guy for it. You know, I was the one who was, you know, able to find him the rare shoes on the planet. And, you know, I said, you know, I'm going to seize this opportunity and really get to know him. And, and I think, you know, from that experience, it really taught me that any of these celebrities, no matter who you are, are just normal people, just like us. And I think that really kind of opened the doors for us, uh, uh, opened the doors for myself moving forward. Um, as I left, obviously, Max and started uh, my own business. So after I left Liebermax, um, after two years of college, my, you can imagine my parents were furious with me. They're like, what the, what the fuck are you doing? You know, leaving this, this job. And I was thinking, you know, I, you know, this is, this is kind of like my time where, you know, I want to explore and, and, you know, even though I was like terrified, but I, I kind of knew that like, I had something, you know, like I'm, I'm kind of like meeting people that I watched on TV and I knew that that was like unusual at that time. And so I ended up just saying, fuck it leaving everything behind. And I started actually a youth basketball training company in China. Um, and the reason for, for that was because, um, you know, I was traveling back to China during the summer times with my parents. And um, I think uh, uh, back in 2014, 2015, around that time when I, when I left Liebermax, I, I ended up traveling to China and, and I started like visiting some of the basketball courts in China. And because I grew up around, you know, basketball, basically my entire life, I was able to kind of, you know, basically uh, understand what's good training and what's what's poor training. And I, I took one look at, you know, what was going on on some of the basketball courts in China. Obviously, you know, enthusiasm about basketball was growing rapidly in China, but the training was terrible. You know, they were like running literal daycares on on these basketball can on these basketball courts in China, and so. I thought there could be a huge opportunity, and that's something that I ended up moving forward with uh, uh, soon after leaving the the finance business. What was the conversation like with your parents? Uh, I'm just sort of curious. Like, um, and, and I guess what was the decision making process uh, for you? Were you pontificating for a while before you sort of decided I'm out, or was it a pretty easy decision? And, the, and I guess the other question is: is like, did, you, did your parents know like the caliber of people you're talking to, like Ron Artest and those kinds of guys? Oh, I'll tell you this. The, the conversation was absolutely brutal. You know, I mean, like for me, um, um, I, I think at that point I had just been constantly disappointing my parents on a frequent basis, you know, like they were like, like world renowned scientists and I'm here, you know, just trying to figure it out, <laughs> hanging out with, you know, guys that are creating a, uh, uh, malice in the palace. And, um, I think my parents were definitely, uh, uh, terrified of, of kind of the direction I was going, but I think they ultimately, you know, saw that I continuously came to them, you know, giving them pushback and just, just wanted to do what I, what I was interested in. And I think like, it just became a point where they really couldn't control me anymore. And so they just kind of said, you know what, if this is like something you want to do, then we'll support you, even though it wasn't real support, but like, they, they, they attempted to give that support, but I think that was kind of all I really needed to really just say, you know what, this is kind of my time and my opportunity to really explore business on my own, even though I had absolutely no clue what I was doing, but it was something that I just knew was, was the right time for me to, to kind of figure things out on my own. How old were you at the time? Like, uh, yes. Yeah, so was I was, I was now three years from college. So I was probably like, 23 24 is all it's, honestly it's like a it's like a daze almost like thinking back but yeah probably 23 24 is kind of when i just said fuck it and just wanted to start this company in in, in youth basketball and i tell you it was it was really difficult i think i think for me like starting out i thought like you know obviously my uh, the reason why i started my my company in china also is because my my uncle was like a, a very um a unique business person in china he he runs the probably the number one auction house in China named Guardian in China. So I always knew that I had some unique family connections in China and I wanted to utilize that. I thought like, you know, before I, um, you know, call this thing quits, I think it's at least worth a shot in terms of me exploring the connections that, you know, I've been blessed with in, in terms of uh, exploring China market. And so I started this youth basketball training business thinking it was going to be pretty, pretty easy and, and seamless, but it was, it was quite the opposite. Um, and you know, I would say like our first two or three camps, like no kids showed up. Maybe we had like one or two kids, you know, come to our camps. And basically what we were doing was we were hosting camps in China and we were flying 
uh, trainers from the U.S. over to China to train students in basketball. And then we also had camps where we were flying students from China to North Carolina, where they would get to train in basketball, get to visit Duke and UNC, um, get to visit, uh, meet with different professors who so happen to obviously be my parents at the time, and also get get to meet with the players. And and, and the reason why I did this business was was also because um, you know I had connected with so many players and athletes through uh, my passion for sneakers, but you know my interest in building a deeper relationship also started to kind of come about. And I, I wanted to really explore a, a business relationship with a lot of these athletes. I didn't want to just be known as like kind of their sneaker guy per se. So I wanted to kind of see if I could help them explore uh, building a fan base in China. And so that's kind of why I did this, uh, did this basketball business. And we even collaborated with like Li Nan, who's the Chinese national team head coach. Um, you know, I brought, um, some of the top uh, basketball trainers from North Carolina who have, you know, a lot of NBA uh, clients. And it, it was really clear that like there was a huge discrepancy in the training um, level in China. And so, yeah, it was crazy. I was like flying over to China with my uh, good friend, this guy cuffs the legend. Um, he's actually a, a dear friend of LeBron James and many other NBA stars. He's now like running his own podcast and, um, you know, he's got like all the top NBA players on, on his pod. And, and we always reflect that, you know, we went back to, uh, we went to China uh, for one summer and it was actually his first time ever leaving North Carolina. He had never left, um, ne never left the state of North Carolina. And so the first trip is like him flying over to China. And you can imagine he's like, doesn't want to try, try the Chinese food. We're there for three weeks for this <laughs> basketball camp with Li Nan and, we're eating McDonald's three times a day, fish fillet sandwiches with no tartar <laughs> sauce. That was his order. And we were there for three weeks doing this basketball camp with Lee Nat. And we were like, wow, this is, this is a story we'll never forget. It's actually a story that we always uh, can resonate with. It's, it's something that I, a bond that I can never, you know, uh, uh, forget with him. Whereabouts in China were you based? We were, we were in Beijing doing these basketball camps. Yeah. It was, it was, uh, yeah, it was a wild time, but it, and we had a lot of friction as well with like the, the trainers that were in China, because it became clear too, that a lot of like trainers from all over the world were actually traveling to China because, because basketball training was in such infancy stage, I think no one really knew what real basketball training was. And so you had guys going over there, like saying, oh yeah, you know, I, I trade LeBron James or I trained all these different athletes where I played professional basketball and there's no checking of that, you know? And so they're getting these jobs and, and they're basically, you know, teaching a bunch of nonsense, you know? And yeah. so that's kind of yeah. like, you know, when, when, when Cuffs and I went out to China, we we're thinking, wow, you know, this, you know, there could be a huge, um, huge opportunity in terms of, of this uh, kind of helping students in China really train in basketball. But I think what, what became the most rewarding thing for me doing all this, uh, doing my basketball camp business was that when I did the uh, USA camp, when we were flying students from China to North Carolina, I also realized that, you know, there's also a huge mental health problem in China uh, during that time. I think you, you can imagine a lot of, um, uh, a lot, there's a lot of social pressure, a lot of pressure from parents on, on their kids to, you know, perform academically. Uh, I think at that time, like, Every, the, all the emphasis on kids was to perform uh, in school and, and it was, it, there was no real balance in, in kids' lifestyle. And when a lot of students started to fly over to our camp, um, I realized that many of them were actually like me. And they all had this kind of interest in sneakers, in collectibles, in sports, in basketball, but they were actually battling themselves much deeper than I was. You know, they weren't as rebellious as I was. And so I actually was, lo I was looking at a lot of these kids that were attending our camps. I was thinking, wow, I see a lot of myself in these kids. And, you know, this it ended up turning from a basketball camp to more of a mental health camp. I would say. Yeah. That's interesting. You say that. Um, Cause I, I, um, I was actually in Shanghai. I was going to Shanghai for, for work. Um, uh, for for a while, but when when I got there, um, 
they they were sort of saying to me like you know and I was single at the time they said to me um John if you if you want a a girlfriend or wife in in Shanghai you basically need like a house and a car and and I think you know growing up in the Western world you think oh man that man China is so materialistic you know but like but they were explaining to me um and you're talking about how much pressure there is on a child they said if you if you think about a one child policy you basically have three sets of parents. You've got your immediate parents, and then you've got your grandparents as well on both sides. And so, and so he was telling me, like, you know, when he was, you know, grade five, grade six, you know, he'd have his, you know, parents waiting for him after a test to sort of see how he went. And they would, and especially if you're a girl, they would be putting a lot of investment, time investment, into your education, your schooling, and everything else. And so, if they marry you off to to somebody. They want to make sure at least like you're going to be okay, right? So like when you look at the the practical sort of elements of it, you know you you can sort of appreciate it. But like you know you know Western sort of Hollywood movies and things like that, they sort of conjure up this whole notion of you know you only you only uh, hook up for love. But uh, in China, I think it's a lot more practical. So I could I could see um, I could see the, the 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 mental sort of pressure that you were that, that they'd be sort of put on. Are you an only child at all? Or you got yeah, siblings? I am an only child. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, so I could probably uh, you probably feel the pressure there too, then for sure. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. But yeah, it was it was it was pretty. Um, it was it was a very uh, unique experience for myself, and I think that like a lot of the students were like really struggling with kind of the social aspect of of moving to the U.S. I feel like all the emphasis is on academic, and for a lot of the students that were attending our camp, many of them were basically. Uh, attending our camp, not even really for the basketball training, but more so because their parents wanted them to kind of fill out this uh, notion of, of studying abroad. And so I think that um, when a lot of the kids came over to the U.S. to our basketball camp, uh, a lot of them lacked kind of the normal, like basic mannerisms that, you know, you obviously deal with in the U.S. And so I think that, you know, like it was funny, we would take these kids to like Chipotle, for example, and like they would be kind of reaching their hand over the glass and stuff, like pointing at different foods. And they were saying, no, you know, you can't, you can't do that. So, you know, it, it just became like more of a camp uh, towards mental health. And I think a lot of that stemmed because a lot of these kids had a very vast interest from what their parents wanted them to be and what they what they wanted them to do. And, um, and yeah, it just became more, conversation than actual basketball training and um it it taught me a lot and also you know showed me that there are also a lot of people out there struggling with very similar things as me when i was growing up yeah amazing so 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 what was next after um after after basketball camp i mean you you sort of set up there and you got in touch with a lot of these different athletes like where, where did you go next yeah so after the basketball camps well we did that business till about december 2019 so during my time uh, doing our basketball training business, I obviously met my business partner Stephen, who you've obviously met before. And um, Stephen was working from uh, from from China at that time. We actually uh, never met in person for probably the first two years of of knowing each other, running this kind of basketball training business. And so the first time that I met him was uh, back in December 2019. So we had probably worked together for about close to two years uh, during that time. And the reason why I went back to China. Uh, during December 2019 was because I actually got invited uh, by Phillips Auction to do a showcase on my sneaker collection because throughout all those years of me growing up and into kind of the youth basketball training business, my collecting of sneakers continued. And so I probably became like a, a top, you know, 50 sneaker collector in the world, I would say, mostly focused around prototype sneakers. So all the shoes I was collecting never released to general public. So they were pairs that were made for, you know, very specific athletes or, or specific uh, uh, musicians. And so I had kind of acquired some very rare shoes, like just to give me an example, like an Eminem Jordan four that was only med- made for friends and family of Eminem. That shoe is probably going for around, you know, $70,000 now in, in you know, auctions today. But like uh, back then, you know, I, I got invited by Phillips auction house. So I flew about probably a million dollars worth of sneakers to China and we were preparing for this sneaker showcase in between, you know, preparing for different basketball camps. But unfortunately, the uh, uh, event ended up being canceled due to COVID. And so Steve and I are sitting in his apartment with all these sneakers in his, in his place. And we're thinking, fuck, man, you know, what are we going to do? You know, everything's like shutting down and, you know, 
our youth basketball training business is so labor intensive. Like, how are we going to pivot our business? And so Steven tells me, hey, I think Chinese social media is going to be the next big thing. And so he ends up showing me a Douyin account, which is Chinese TikTok of an NBA player named Christoph Porzingis, who was playing on the New York Knicks at the time, actually a good friend of mine. And I took one look at the account and I was thinking, yo, who, who is running this account? Because they're kind of like posting some like bullshit content on his page, like stuff that I knew that, you know, Porzingis would not be happy about. And so I ended up reaching out to Kristaps uh, Porzingis's brother on uh, text when I was in China. I said, hey, do you know who's running your brother's Chinese social media? And he said, I, we have no clue what's being posted on there. And so I started you know, showing him some of the content and they were clearly not happy with what was being posted. And, and, and you know, that, that kind of gave Stephen, uh, Stephen and I an idea that maybe there could be a big opportunity. So while I'm still in China, we said, well, why not try uh, content for myself? You know, I have all these shoes here. Let's, let's test something out. So we start opening a Billy Billy account, which I had no fucking clue what, what this platform was about, but Steve, Stephen was basically telling me it was the hottest thing on the planet in, in China for, for social media. It's basically like Chinese YouTube. We started with a one minute long video of DJ Khaled talking about me in a sneaker store a few months prior, basically calling me his secret key in the shoe world. And, you know, if someone, you know, found out that I was his shoe plug, someone at Nike would get fired. And that That's video crazy. ended up surpassing a hundred thousand views in 24 hours. So we're thinking we're, we're, we're definitely onto something. And Dude, so D D D DJ Khaled is a huge name. How did you, how did you meet him? Yeah. So DJ Khaled and I got connected, um, uh, back when I was in, uh, uh, New York, um, doing the, uh, hedge fund business. And, you know, he was a huge sneaker collector. Um, and he, he, he was very, very smart about it. He was chasing after the same kind of prototype sneakers that I was, because I think he recognized very quickly that sneaker heads are very sticky. And during the 12, like, kind of time period between 2012 and 2016, I would say sneakers were extremely hot. And so I think DJ Khaled uh, recognized that very quickly and he started buying all these prototype shoes. And so I actually was basically providing him with access to a lot of these kind of rare shoes. And every time he would post them, uh, he would end up on every sneaker blog on the planet. And I think that, you know, then attributed to him turning into the first, I believe he was the first hip hop artist ever signed to Jordan brand. Um, and, you know, I think, I think Jordan brand has obviously elevated his brand value uh, to the next level. And so, yeah, that's kind of how I got uh, connected with Khaled. And, you know, we've been friends ever since uh, just through our passion of sneakers. That's crazy. So, sorry, yeah, sorry to interrupt you, but you, so you got onto Billy Billy, you posted a, yeah. a video of DJ Khaled. It got crazy hits. That, that one next. Yeah, crazy hits. Yeah, and so so I end up saying, all right, I gotta I gotta get back home, you know. So I I travel back to um, New York. We start looking through uh, kind of my network of of celebrity friends, and and we were just trying to figure out like who who's gonna try out this Chinese social media. And so we end up um, uh, contacting this kid Onyeka Kongwu, who was going to be into the NBA draft uh, for that. I think the the next month uh, coming up. And so, you know, he basically told us, you know, I'm going to be a top 10 you know, pick in the NBA draft, but I'm not even like the top 10 most popular player in my draft class. Like I want to be able to explore China as a way to help build my brand presence and compete with my peers. And so we thought, you know, this is kind of the perfect candidate to explore Chinese social media. So, you know, we, we helped him direct like three, two minute long videos of him basically saying, Hey, China, on different platforms. So we launched him on Tencent, the largest company in China. We launched him on Douyin, Chinese TikTok. And he was actually the first NBA player ever on Billy Billy Chinese YouTube. And so those three two minute long videos ended up surpassing over 10 million views in one week of time. And so we knew, all right, this is definitely kind of like the the um the business that we want to explore. And so uh that we we kind of hit the ground running and and started contacting more of my of my uh, celebrity friends and since then you know that business is still ongoing and you know we've signed dj cod exclusively in china market uh fat joe uh kate cunningham uh who was the number one pick in the uh, nba draft two years ago we signed paulo boncaro the number one pick in last year's nba draft and we've been basically helping them 
uh, build their brand presence in China by helping them uh, make content in China for the Chinese audience, helping them build their uh, brand, their, their following in China, and then helping them monetize from there. That's insane, dude. So, and like, uh, how do you monetize from that? Are you monetizing off Billy Billy, off views and stuff like that, or how does that work? Yeah, I think uh, obviously viewership is kind of like a small piece of it, but mostly like brand deals. So it was very dependent. Like, like we were kind of uh, uh, working on like a bespoke kind of um, uh, environment with each client. So um, everyone had different needs, but yeah, it was mostly like product placement, brand deals, etc. And that business is actually still ongoing. And um, yeah, we we completely pivoted in from youth basketball training into Chinese social media. We, we basically became the Chinese bit business partner of DJ Khaled. Uh, you know, where where um, you know, it, it, it was uh, it's it's been a ride, and and that business is now called Monarch. And the reason why we came up with the name Monarch uh, for for our China business is because you know we're dealing with the most recognizable U.S. celebrities in the world. The monarch butterfly is probably the most recognizable U.S. butterfly in the world. And the way the butterfly travels is kind of like fluttering around how we believe many of our celebrities are also fluttering and exploring China market with us, exploring, you know, a new market for them. And so that's kind of how we came up with the name Monarch and and how we uh, how we kind of started this new venture. Amazing. Well, why, why don't you um, talk to us a little bit about Monarch? So I think, you know, well, you know, what was the inspiration behind it? I think um, how did you sort of figure out that there was a there was a gap that you sort of tried to serve yeah so i would say for us um uh the inspiration behind monarch was my passion for collectibles and i think when we started doing the chinese social media for you know different a-list celebrities it was it was kind of like a wake-up call for me because i think you know for me i had basically been going at a thousand miles an hour just testing things you know there was no time to really stop and think about what we were doing, but I was just getting into some very unique rooms. And when I look back, you know, ha having done basically running the entire China branding for DJ Khaled, I'm thinking, wow, none of this stuff would be possible without collectibles. You know, I would not be here doing all these things for people who I idolized if it weren't for this kind of mutual passion in sneakers. And so I think that was kind of something that really kind of told me that maybe I am supposed to be in this kind of collectibles industry, something that I don't really think had been like fully fleshed out yet. And so, um, yeah, I think that's kind of what has inspired me to, um, you know, explore the collectibles space in a more, in a more broader sense and also kind of how we got into web three. And so maybe I can dive into that. So around 2021, you know, as we're exploring China market for many of our celebrity clients in China, I discovered NFTs for the first time. Um, I would say that, you know, a lot of the sneaker collectors that I grew up with were hustlers. They're all hustlers. And, you know, as I mentioned, that period between 2012 and 2016 was a time where, you know, a lot of the sneaker collectors made a lot of money. But after that, as quickly as things, you know, heat up, you know, the, the collectible also has to cool down at some point. And so I think there was a kind of a period in time for two years where a lot of sneaker collectors started to pivot their interest in the collectibles world, looking for other things that could make the money. And so I started realizing back in 2021, around August, I started seeing a lot of my friends were like posting different NFTs. And like, there, there was like kind of no reasoning behind it. It was just like, oh, I, I made like four ETH or I made five ETH. And at this time, I'm like still not even really deep into crypto by any means. I'm thinking, wow, like maybe I should, maybe I should get into this. And so I, I ended up buying like a few NFTs. I basically like kind of dived in head first. I spent like. What was your first NFT? Do you remember? Yeah, it was a uh, Wicked Ape Bone Club or something like that. And I, I'm sure that a lot of people could relate to that project. I, I think that was kind of like an interesting time in the market, you know? But like, so, so when, I just remember. Uh, just time step this for us as well. When was this? Yeah. Like, this was like probably August of 2021, I'd say, mm, around yeah. that time. Yeah, yeah so and apes, I just saw I, like a, I, I, yeah. apes, apes, apes just were like in around just May. Getting, yeah, yeah, getting hot. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I was buying the the kind of bullshit version of that. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I I had no clue what was going on. You know, I basically like a lot of my friends were saying, you know, buy these NFTs, don't ask any questions. So I kind of just you know dove head first, <laughs> spent 30, 30 grand into some 
you know, bullshit <laughs> NFT projects, then discover Discord for the first time. I start poking around these discords, and I think at that time, you know, celebrity shilling was like a huge thing. And I'm seeing people say, you know, let's go spam X, XYZ's Twitter. And I'm thinking, yo, some of those guys that are being mentioned are actually my friends, you know? And so as we were exploring the China market for, you know, our celebrities, I told Stephen, there could be a huge opportunity in this Web3 space, especially because there's this kind of enthusiasm and interest in people that are within our network in terms of exploring Web3. So I would say, you know, over those next few months, I was just getting rugged left and right, just like testing things. And, <laughs> you know, I, I bought a bunch of, a bunch of uh, like garbage back in 2021. But like, I was just like, you know, testing things and really learning about Discord and communities. And I learned a lot. And I think um, it became evident that, you know, we really wanted to explore Web3 because, you know, if you look at the entire collectibles ecosystem, like, you can't really deny this kind of new wave of digital assets. And so, you know, Steve and I started to explore and, and we ended up starting with, um, you know, this artist named Edgar Plans. You know, Edgar Plans is a, a pretty well-known Spanish contemporary artist, um, actually a good friend of mine. And I had actually bought a painting of his um, uh, probably a month prior to his NFT project releasing. And, you know, there was some enthusiasm from him to get in touch with DJ Khaled because obviously, you know, we, he had, heard, he had heard about what we were doing for Khaled in China market. And so we ended up, you know, kind of walking Khaled through getting like a one of one uh, honorary little hero. And, and he ended up posting it on the day of the launch. And so that kind of um, opened a lot of doors for us. You know, we, Steve and I ended up being on the board of advisors for this Edgar Plains Little Heroes project. We started ha ha uh, helping uh, other different NFT projects and really kind of learning um, kind of what the ins and outs were in, in terms of you know, how these projects are, are operating. And, and I think it taught us a lot. And eventually, you know, we kind of came to the conclusion that, you know, we really want to also explore this Web3 space, especially because, you know, if we're building this kind of collectibles community, this collectibles institution, and also educating so many people about kind of diversifying their collecting portfolio, you know, it, you, we cannot ignore uh, this kind of NFT space that was booming at that time. So that's kind of how we uh, pivoted and also started to explore this kind of uh, new world. Mm, amazing. So, so tell us a bit more, like specifically, like, like what what is Monarch? You know exa exactly, and you know what what, um, what 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 are you sort of planning with it? Yeah. So so for us, you know, what Monarch is 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 we're building this kind of community of all top collectors all over the world. I think you know from my personal experience as a collector, you know, obviously as I mentioned, I started with sneakers and and sports memorabilia, sports cards. But, you know, over the years, my interests have also pivoted myself. You know, I started collecting, you know, fashion pieces from brands like Chrome Hearts, and I started getting into traditional art, and I started getting into time pieces like Patek Philippe. And, and then I also, you know, started to dive into this NFT space. And I thought, you know, it's kind of an incredible place, especially because if you look back at, you know, kind of my start in collecting, like I was I felt like uh, I was I was a loner doing all this stuff. But like when you look at kind of what was happening back in 2021 with the collectibles and NFTs, it was all about community. And that was something that I really missed, you know, when I was growing up as a collector and something that, you know, I was uh, I was, um, you know, really excited, excited to see come to fruition in kind of this new uh, digital world. So for us, you know, you know, we care deeply about educating, you know, top collectors about diversifying their collecting portfolio. And so we've been building this community and monarch of top collectors from all types of collectibles, as I mentioned, from fashion pieces to time pieces, sneakers, sports memorabilia, cars, um, watches, everything you can imagine. And, you know, we're, be we're building this uh, uh, hub of collectors and, and, you know, we're trying to build um, a top collectibles institution. I would say the you know, the problem that, you know, we're trying to solve in monarch is that, I think there's been a huge explosion in investment opportunities for both physical and digital collectibles. There's also been an explosion of ways to educate people about these opportunities through products, you know, podcasts, and also other types of content. And, you know, I think it's just really exceptionally difficult for newcomers and also existing collectors to really consistently participate in the collecting opportunities. And I think like, you know, anytime you're at the forefront of, of an industry, it's always going to be tough mentally, you know, because you're the first to do it. And I think 
you know, as I mentioned many times, you know, I was kind of the first person in, in my, in my community growing up, like doing this kind of sneaker collecting and turning that into a passion and, 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 and ultimately into a business. And, um, I look at kind of the things that's happening within NFTs and crypto. It's, it's still very foreign to, uh, kind of the broader audience and, and general public. And, and, and it's going to take constant education to you know, proper education. You know, obviously like I didn't really have proper education getting into web three when people are saying, you know, buy this, it's going to 10 X. And I think as quickly as people have come into the web three space during that time is also as quickly as they've, le as they've left. And I think it's really important to properly educate people and spend the time and tell the stories and, and share information to really educate people properly about the space. Cause I think that's ultimately what's going to create the mass adoption wave for, for crypto and also uh, this new age of digital collectibles. Mm, amazing. And mate, mate, just to go a little bit deeper, I'd love to, love to sort of get your take on, I guess your collecting style, right? So like, you know, over the years, you must've been able to curate and collect you know, pretty special pair of sneakers. I know you collect a bit of contemporary art and the like as well. Um, but like for you, like, what you know, what, what are the key things you look out for when you're sort of collecting? Like what, what sort of drives you to, to get, to pick up the pieces that you do and, and sort of see something that nobody else does? Yeah, I think ultimately it's got to be something that draws me in right away. You know, it's got to be something that I, I feel some kind of attachment to immediately. I would say that, you know, in the beginning of my collecting journey, um, I didn't really feel confident in that feeling, you know, and I think because of that, because I didn't have the support system, because I felt alone, you know, a lot of those kind of opportunities uh, came and went and I missed out on a lot of opportunities and, and things that I should have just kind of trusted my gut. And I think that, you know, now that I'm like much deeper in the space and, you know, I basically built my entire life around collectibles is that, you know, I really have to kind of trust my intuition and what what kind of speaks to me. And so like, usually like I'll know right away, like when I see something that I want, like I'll, I'll definitely kind of, uh, uh, kind of go in with more conviction in terms of like what, what I, what I'm chasing after. And I think like, you know, that's just takes time and experience, you know, like spending more and more time, you know, collecting. I mean, th this is really a, truly a lifestyle for me. Like I, I live and breathe collectibles. Like a lot of my friends are, uh, are, are, are all, collectors of something and so you know i'm constantly you know living this and so i think like you know you really have to just spend the time and 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 properly um you know educate oneself about about how you you know what what are kind of the uh traits or or things that that trigger you to collect something or not right and so i think for me it's like if i see something that i i think i, I think has a chance or or I kind of like am attached to right away. I usually pull the trigger right now. Mm. Right away. Awesome. And um, any alpha, anything that you're sort of bullish on in the next, you know, 12 months? Hey, I, I really like this Winds of Yawan Hour project that I obviously missed the, the, <laughs> the original mid when you guys were telling me about it in Hong Kong. Like once I saw the art, that's something I knew I kind of missed out on. So I've been trying to pick some up, um, unfortunately not for the mint price, but definitely picking some up on secondary market. I think it's a really cool project. Um, I really am interested in this uh, Rafiq Anadol artist. Um, I think he's making really cool work. And I think the the works are ultimately, they, they look great and they're unique. And so, and I also really like the the um, collectors who are, who are buying the works, you know? So I think uh, it's definitely something that I'm, I'm eyeing in a big way to, to accumulate some more pieces. Definitely a lot of punk collectors in uh, Winds of Yawanawa for sure. So uh, I think that uh, perhaps adds uh, a little bit of uh, value to Rafik, uh, Rafik's collection. So uh, I see you cooking up something with Avant Art. Um, are you able to share a little bit about that? Because I just saw that tweet and uh, I know Avant, a pretty big name in the in the art space. Yeah, absolutely. So Avant Art and Monarch uh, is hosting a collaborative event in Hong Kong. Uh, coming up towards the end of this month from January 26th to January 28th. And um, it's a way where, you know, we're basically previewing some of Avant Art's 2024 uh, releases with some of their biggest artists uh, in the world. And so they're going to be um, showcasing some new works from artists from uh, George Kondo and uh, 
uh, Tai Wu Chang and also uh, Robert Nava and also be showcasing some of the history of their works uh, throughout the years as well. And we're going to be hosting this event at Soho House Hong Kong as a way to kind of share this crossover between traditional art and digital art uh, to uh, the Hong Kong audience. Because to, to me, you know, obviously I met you in, in Hong Kong this past August and it became very clear to me that there's a deep enthusiasm for digital art and for crypto and for collectibles. And it's, it's kind of this like a uh, very fast growing market in Hong Kong. And I, I just love the energy and enthusiasm from Hong Kong. And, you know, I, I, you know, Curtis Penning from Avant Art is a dear friend of mine. I just told him, you know, I think it's a great opportunity, especially with you guys pivoting into digital art and in the way that you are and really, you know, kind of bridging the gap between this crossover between traditional art and digital art, you know, it could be a really great way for you guys to showcase, you know, what you guys are doing. Cause I, I truly believe that Avant Art is the number one print house in the world. Uh, and, and also doing the best job in terms of uh, showcasing this crossover between traditional and digital art. Yeah. Amazing, man. And, and I can't wait um, for, for that weekend. I think uh, you got, you, you, I mean, you dropped some pretty big uh, traditional trad, trad artist names there. Um, but uh, yeah, Van, Van Art's got an interesting business model, right? Because like, uh, correct me if I'm wrong as well. So my, my understanding of their business model is that they mostly focus on prints, right? Um, and and they, they're able to, if you go through the website, I think they're able to secure some of the biggest um, traditional art names uh, you can sort of think of. But but I think if you, if you go back into the trend art world, most of these artists, they would go through, you know, a pace gallery or something like that, where basically they would sell limited one-on-ones for extremely high prices. And obviously the demographic of those um, galleries are very different. They're sophisticated, you know, high net worth individuals, et cetera. But Avant Art feels like they've just got that younger market sort of stitched up, uh, a little bit more affordable price points, um, a younger demographic, which artists wouldn't be able to get through, I guess, a pace gallery and the like. And so I think Avant Art almost feels like they're servicing a very um, big mass mass audience uh, and getting eyeballs to a collection and also a brand name of an artist, which is, which is a very unique value proposition too. Right. Is that, is that, am I sort of seeing that right with Avant Art? Like. Yeah, I think that's definitely my impression. Obviously I can't speak for them, but as a collector, I would say that, you know, their pieces are such high quality and, you know, with them working with some of the most prominent artists around the world, you know, for a Gen Z Gen Alpha collector, it's probably difficult to afford like a George Kondo work or or a, a Robert Nava painting, for example. But I think, you know, Avant is giving, you know, the kind of the younger uh, a collector an opportunity to collect some of these more prominent artists work in a way in the form of like a print or a sculpture. But with the quality being what it is, it, it does have that kind of feel of like a one of one piece in your home. And so I think you know, they've truly mastered the quality of these works. And I also think that the founders of Avon Art, Christian and Curtis, are doing such a phenomenal job in terms of uh, exploring new avenues in terms of educating young collectors into collecting art. You know, this actually isn't our first collaboration uh, that we're doing in Hong Kong, but we've also collaborated in terms of bringing a life-size James Sheen sculpture into the Rolling Loud Hip Hop Music Festival in New York. And, you know, we even hosted a panel at the Harvard blockchain conference last uh, school year. And we had this kind of conversation between this crossover of traditional and digital art. And obviously Avon shared kind of their thoughts and, and um, approach in terms of how they're going about that. So I truly believe that they're much more than just a print house, but they're really kind of uh, exploring new avenues and, and uh, bringing to light new kind of creative ways of, of education. And um, I, I believe that they're really at the forefront of, of uh, bringing kind of um, the Gen Z culture into collecting art in a big way. Yeah, and, and in some ways, I think the um, a little bit of legitimacy in the uh, NFT sort of crypto space too. I mean, they've had Grant Yoon, um, Snowfro, they've had, um, who else have they had? Dimitri Cherniak, you know, some really big sort of crypto names sort of coming through. Um, so pretty excited for that. And I think... Um, We've got William Mapan coming up as well, so um, big big fan of him. And I, and, and I missed that Alpha Centauri drop as well. So that was a beautiful sort of piece. Yeah, that went crazy, huh? 
that went nuts. Um, so uh, yeah, no, ex- excited for 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 Monarch, dude. And um, I, I guess switching gears a little bit, um, punks. How did you hear about punks, and you know, eventually find your way into buying a punk? Yeah, so as I was buying these wicked bone clubs, you know, I started hearing <laughs> about, you know, crypto punks and board apes. And I think at that time, I just had no clue what I was doing, you know, and I was kind of just like winging it and, and really kind of exploring the space uh, on my own. But throughout those months, and obviously, you know, that's back in 2021. And, you know, the first punk I bought was this past October, so quite recently, but you know, I would say since then, you know, I just continuously kept hearing more about crypto pump, crypto pump. And I was thinking, you know, I really need to do more research into this. And I mean, the research would definitely have probably done me uh, some good, you know, and I could have avoided a lot of these losses on, you know, Wicked Bone Club, etc. But, you know, I really just needed to find the time to educate myself about crypto punk. And I think what was really fascinating about it is it's, it's it's kind of similar to like comic books. Like, you know, I also am a collector of comic books and, you know, I actually specifically collect like first appearance comic books of like different uh, top characters. And to me, CryptoPunk is like the first ever profile picture uh, 10,000 collection project. And it's just, it's just, I mean, it's an art, you know, and it's something that like I just started to uh, become more fond of throughout the years and and then obviously what really kind of like um tipped me to buy the crypto punk is obviously meeting the community members and i think you know maxwell like meeting you and also uh dj to soy in, in in hong kong and um you know meeting some of your friends who are also crypto punk holders it was just like a amazing experience i just love kind of the energy and and um kind of like kind of how your 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 mythology and exploring the web3 space and it's just something that i just couldn't pass up and something that i i just had to be a part of and, and um, uh, you're definitely a big reason as to why i, I had to dive into the crypto fund community myself this past october uh, amazing uh, glad to sort of hear that um so I, I, was, I wasn't necessarily shilling my own bags but glad that you found a lot of value out of it um and and talk to us a little bit about when you're buying your punk, how were you thinking about trait selections, and how did you end up with uh, seven nine three four with the uh, the baller headband? Yeah, so seven nine three four spoke to me right away, especially because um, of the headband. You know, I think like if you look at kind of my history as an entrepreneur, uh, a lot of it ties back to sports and and my passion for basketball and and kind of that sports culture and. And the headband is obviously kind of, to me, a representation of sport. Um, and, and it's just something that I felt like I, I had to have. Obviously, my hairline's also probably receding. I think eventually I'll probably be bald just like my, my, uh, my punk as well. Um, and then I think from, from the shades, like, I, you know, I, I, I get drippy sometimes. Like, I'm pretty deep in the fashion world. So I thought that that was also a good kind of representation of, of kind of the uh, – of uh of kind of having some fashion sense as well so you know the punk that i pick is actually really the perfect one for me i'd say amazing no he's a he's a cool looking punk for sure and then if you know money wasn't an issue for you like um do you have like a dream punk uh outside of this one dream punk i definitely like the hoodie ones especially because i'm a i'm a pretty big hoodie guy myself i'm always you can always find me in in a hoodie myself and and um, I, I haven't really like did a deep dive into a, like a specific hoodie one, but like the hoodie tray is is definitely a, a pretty cool one, I would say. Nice, yeah, they're they're pretty uh, uh, highly sought after, but uh, they are they look do they do look pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> and um, if you look across, I guess the punk community, do you have a, a favorite sort of punk personality or a series of punks? I mean, to to me, I mean, I think. Uh, uh, you obviously know I care deeply about education, and um, I think Monarch as a whole uh, also cares deeply about education. So what what you're doing here with Punkcast is something that you know I find to be amazing for the crypto punk community to be able to share stories and voices of all the crypto punks. So so really not to like sound kind of strange <laughs> on this pod, but like really I, I I I'm still like getting to know a lot of crypto punks now, so I haven't like really met a lot of the personalities per se but like 
I, you know, I, I care deeply about education. I think it's really important for collections like CryptoPunk, for collectibles like CryptoPunk, and you know, people that are sharing that kind of voice and and stories behind, um, you know, the people that are collecting it is really important. So to me, I'd say that you're my uh, my top personality right now. I'd say. Ah, uh, appreciate it, Barney. Um, FYI for the listeners, this this wasn't paid either. So, uh, so it's pre- not appreciate paid, you. Not a paid show, all right? I'm just. <laughs> No, uh, it means a lot, mate. So I do appreciate that. And, um, and, and, you know, you've been in and out of collectibles culture and, and various sort of communities, uh, in the past, but how would you sort of describe punk culture for you from, from what you've sort of seen? Yeah, I think punk culture, um, is kind of like, uh, uh, um, very forward thinking. I would say that, um, I'm seeing this like trend. Obviously I can't speak for, every crypto punk and I know not all crypto punks are into art or digital art, but I definitely think that this kind of punk culture is very, uh, rebellious, very, uh, forward thinking, very similar to how I feel about, you know, my approach in terms of, you know, exploring my personal career and collectibles. And so I kind of feel like, um, you know, crypto punks are really paving the way for this new, age and digital art and to me you know digital art is still very much in its infancy stage i believe that you know there's going to need to be a lot more storytelling a lot more um content uh to really build this kind of new world of digital art and i believe that crypto punk will have a huge uh dna imprint on 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 dna of uh, digital art becoming more prominent in the world today amazing um and uh, how would you feel about V1 punks? Do you have a view? Yeah, I have I have a V1 punk myself. I know there's obviously a lot of um, kind of stories and, and narratives of this kind of a conversation about it being the first one. And I think that, um, I, f- I think for every collectible in the world is about the storytelling from the collectors. And I think that that really shows that there's a really strong community for V1 Punk, which is obviously one of the reasons why I bought my V1 Punk. And I think, you know, the conversations and and um, and narratives around V1 being the first, I think as long as the uh, community is continuously pushing that narrative, I think we'll 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 see V1 Punks really thrive. And and I'm I'm definitely a firm believer of V1 Punks. I think that they'll definitely have a, a huge part in this kind of uh, Web3 NFT history. Nice. I'd love to see the inclusivity there, mate. So uh, that's good. And uh, mate, I guess uh, another question I just want to ask you, just moving back to your sneakers, what, what's your favorite Jordan collection or what's your favorite Jordan series? Definitely the Jordan 11, I would say. I think the uh, the Jordan 11 is like kind of like futuristic for that time, you know, having the patent leather. I mean, you, you can't, you can't um, go wrong with the Jordan 11 sneakers. It's definitely my favorite shoe i think there's definitely like sneakers like the jordan 11 that really come to mind uh especially when i look back at like my childhood like the iverson jordan 4 with i mean i'm sorry the iverson 4 with the zipper where you know you stepped over tyron lou they're 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 very specific shoes that definitely speak to my childhood but i'd say the jordan 11 is definitely the, the most prominent one Nice. I, I, um, I gotta say they're probably mine as well. Not to, not to sort of uh, copy you, but, um, they're the ones that look like a, a, tux, a tuxedo shoe, right? That's right. Like that. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. They, I love those. And so, uh, oh, what was your first pair of Jordans that you had? Uh, probably a pair of Jordan fours, I'd say. Um, yeah, very early. I, I was, I was collecting sneakers pretty early. Um, Excellent. Hey, Barney, this is a super fun conversation, man. And I guess, uh, you know, one sort of final uh, sort of question before we close off, but um, if you could leave a message to the next owner of your punk, 7934, what would you like to say to them? All right. So for me, you know, I've been obviously in this collectibles world for so long. I think a lot of the things that I am interested in also are very much related into fashion and you know, I've, I've even invested in some some clothing brands as well. I really care. I, I'm really enthusiastic about high fashion. Um, I, I care a lot about details. The one thing that I ask, okay, is please just don't post my my uh, seven nine three four on a Hanes t shirt. That's all I ask. It's just <laughs> don't print my my crypto punk on a Hanes t shirt because I I, I have uh, much more higher standards than that. 
it's a uh, LV or bust, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would also like to kind of sh like finish the, um, kind of the full, the full picture of like, you know, my, the, the collecting with the mental health as well as cause like, you know, for my parents, as I mentioned, you know, both of them, neither of them were really supportive of me early on in, in kind of my collecting journey. And as I mentioned, I think it's a collecting is definitely a constant mental battle within yourself um, in terms of, you know, the grind, you know, the, the price, the price fluctuations, the, the deals, the scams, everything that, that kind of goes into it, the, the family social pressures. But now that I'm like kind of deep into this kind of collectibles business, I'd say, you know, I, I definitely think it's come full circle with my parents in particular, you know, both my parents, I would say when, um, when, uh, sneakers and sports cards started to get hot, uh, during pandemic and obviously sneakers being a little bit earlier, uh, my parents were actually calling me saying, do you still have all those sports cards that you've been, you know, collecting over the years? Do you have all those, um, sneakers that, that you, did you keep all those sneakers? And, and then, you know, you kind of look at your parents thinking, gosh, like, I would just wish you were a little bit more supportive earlier on, but um, I think it. I, I think it also helps, you know, my relationship with my parents as well uh, come full circle, and it's really kind of like a true, uh, true showing for me that like uh, collectibles is really kind of a, a constant um, kind of uh, engagement with your mental health, and and you know, for me personally, it's, it's really come full circle with kind of my parents now giving me kind of their full support and blessing in terms of exploring this collectibles collectibles world and i can say now that they're you know they talk to their friends a little bit more proudly than they did when i was a kid oh, amazing and uh, dude like uh it, it must i mean there's so many um similarities with nfts in some ways and it's about being an outsider and um you know and i think it's sort of nice to sort of hear a story like that where basically you almost feel a little bit more validated once once they come around right once the price action comes and then they sort of come around and just like, well, it's not a surprise. I, I sort of told you so. And I sort of feel like that's the same sentiment that we have about, you know, Bitcoin, ETH, and some of the NFTs that we have a conviction in. It's just going to take a little bit of time. I mean, they're not living and breathing like we are every single day, but hopefully um, hopefully they come around there. But, and, and, and a great testament to you too, you know, to to push through there, trust yourself and uh, and back yourself in, man. So, uh, and you've done extremely well. So I'm really excited to... Um, see what you build next in monarch and uh, looking forward to you coming to sort of hong kong so i uh, appreciate you coming up yes sir thanks so much for having me man really look forward to uh, seeing you in hong kong as well so thanks thanks so much for having me awesome guys that wraps up another episode of punk cast for the week and we'll be back next week with another amazing punk bye for now